we are back but this time we are in the same room jordan hello how are you doing i'm good Zimmy. i'm good Zimmy. good to see you in person i know well this is it's real with jordan demi um presented by pop Test. and today we have someone really cool another chicago artist taylor bennett yeah you're referring to we had uh joey perp yes on the show uh, a couple weeks ago so we're staying in chicago I know. And if you're into the music industry or you want to know more information about um, being an independent artist um, and the music business in general, this episode is going to be super cool. So stay tuned. You have a new album out. Yes, sir. Yeah. So tell us about, like, give us the rundown of how it came together and um, what people can expect. Um, it's probably like, I want to say the most, and thank you for asking me that because I love to talk about myself. Yeah, I, I, we got to start out with the new stuff first, right? And then right. You track back. Yeah, beautiful. So like, man, um, I want to say first off, I think this was like, one of my most fun projects. Um, and when I say that, I mean, I enjoyed myself very much so. And the whole creation, marketing, um, as an artist, I'm an independent artist and I've always been an independent artist. So kind of through the years, I've grown with the experience and relationships and kind of just, I guess, the fundamentals on how to put out a record or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but also through learning that, um, the fundamentals are like the institutional way to market and promote yourself as like an artist, mainstream artist. It gets kind of boring. Um, and I feel like a lot of the marketing things that I was doing with projects before this and even a lot of the ideas were definitely sparked by wanting it to be as big as it could be. Um, and that's super dope, you know, like anything that you do um, outside of music and to anybody that's watching, I hope you're trying to make it as big and bright as it can be. But there's also an aspect of being an artist um, where, you know, you kind of want to not just be successful, but be successful doing the things that you feel are cool and that I've always felt were cool as a kid. Um, so this project for me was like super nostalgic. And one of the reasons why it was so fun is because it was so nostalgic. And instead of, and, you know, not to say that in the past I've worked with artists strictly off clout as they call it um but i do know for sure this project with the artists that i collaborated with was definitely more focused on what i grew up loving listening to um so like there's like some amazing features and artists and people that i really as a kid for example like um tom higginson is on the album he's on today and hey there delilah like growing up I don't know how many times that they were able to track that I played that. Um, but it's like that was, you know, growing up a dream for me. Like, um, and the experience of reaching out to Tom Higginson on Instagram and saying, hey, man, like I grew up loving your stuff. Like I'm putting together some new work. I would love to work with you. And just the organic and also um, IRL or real life experience behind two artists, but also a fan of an artist being able to work it's like a beautiful thing and I had so much fun and I really continued to do that and that became like the vibe for the project was me doing the things that I wanted to see happen not just now but also as a kid and dream collaborations and then also expanding you know some of my fans that might not have been familiar with you know hey there Delilah or we have Madden Kim on the album like Daylight and a lot of those songs that's my childhood. That's my whole life. Um, and I what think- was it like having him come on stage at that show? It was insane. That was, so um, that was, I want to say the first time that I had ever, it was the first time that I've met, ever met Tom in real life. But prior to that, like I said, like being an independent artist, I'm talking to him about splits. We're sending back the records and things like that, but it's all digital. <laughs> Um, and I will say that that night it clicked for me and also because it was a performance. So it was my show, it was in Chicago, and it was like exactly what I wanted to see, which was all of these kids screaming and singing, hey there to Lila. Wow. And again, and like kind of bathing in this moment. 
um, whatever that memory was for you. And I feel like in music in general, just in the world, man, like after COVID and during COVID, when I was working on this project, my thought was like, we need something that we can all experience together. Um, and I feel like that's where the title coming of age and these kind of elements of life kind of implemented their way in. Yeah. yeah. Well, as you were, as you were talking about the album and, and the show and everything, as I was thinking, I was like, the, the album title comes from the fact that you're bridging your childhood with the current day. Yeah, definitely. That's like the whole thing. And um, I also think it's really cool, man, because I feel like there's some really heartfelt records on this project. Um, like today, again, with Tom Higginson is really like a super deep song, but you know, I got to perform it um, on Good Morning America, shout out to them. And like, it's kind of like a surreal moment to not just work with your idols, but to also create something that like you really genuinely believe in and support. And then to get the attention that you're hoping to receive around it, um, it created, and I'll even say it for me, and I really love it, everybody around me would agree, it has given me just like this kind of feeling of success that doesn't have to come from other people. And I think that that's also something that I was trying to get away from as an artist and, you know, make my fans happy, of course. But if Taylor's have not happy, how's anybody going to be happy? You know, um, yeah. like a self-care kind of project for sure. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I noticed if I, I, you know, as we're journalists, so we have to analyze the music and come up yeah. with questions and stuff. And as I was listening to the new album, I was like, there's a lot of people now who, who were like hip hop or R and B who are now incorporating more rock sounds. But yeah. a lot of times they're like changing. They're like, I'm no longer hip hop. I'm no longer R and B. I'm a rocker yeah. now. And I, like, <laughs> and I feel like you've added on, you're like, building onto the foundation because you Thank still you. have a, a, a you still have your like Chicago R and B hip hop vibes. You're just yeah. adding guitars on top of it. Thank so, you, man. Yeah. So tell me about what it was like to kind of incorporate that rock sound with the stuff that you had made, you know, four or five, six years ago. It was really interesting, man. And I'm glad you asked that question. Um you know, like growing up, man, like I, I've always been like, I'm a fan of music. And I think that's why I love the business so much as well. Um, because, you know, outside of even this, I work with other artists, I manage my brother. Um, but I've always loved music, like all genres of music. And I know like growing up and even to today, like there's people that might, I hear them say, oh, I don't really listen to country or I don't really listen to rock or I don't, I don't really listen to hip hop. And it's always like rubbed me in the craziest way when I hear somebody say that, because it's like, how do you not listen to a genre? How do you not feel like you can belong or that a sound is for a specific group? Um, <clears throat> so I guess- We're still here. We just do a solo layout like this. Awesome. No, I love it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess with this project and loving music and loving business so much, um, I was- I've always been very curious about the idea of genres. Um, and, you know, I think that a lot of times anything that has to do with a specific label can be dangerous. Um, and I felt like as a hip hop artist for like a really long time, I was working and kind of almost seen as a, a rebellious hip hop artist, as some people might say, a conscious rapper is like a big word for it. Um, yeah. And being like, as a kid, I feel like the reason why people would call me a conscious artist is because like, I grew up listening to the Beatles and the Smiths and Queen and, um, you know, Motown, like uh, Smokey Robinson and Aretha Franklin and like, just all of these different kind of genres. Um, and I, it was always very influential in the music that I created. And even the vocal ranges are sometimes singing on certain songs that people felt like were rap songs. Like that was all um, very much influential from the music diversity that I had growing up. And I felt like I want to continue to push that because I feel like there were so many great artists when I was growing up um, that showed me, you know, an insight into a different world just based off of a collaboration or a certain beat or a certain written composition that they would illustrate. Um, so yeah, that was, that was really big for me trying to bring in the rock vibes and something that I saw years ago 
And this was like the most important thing because I know I just said some names like mm -hmm. Queen, the Smiths, uh, the Beatles. Um, I love rock and roll and I've always loved rock and roll. Hey Jude is one of my favorite songs. Simon and Garfunkel, um, Please, Please, Please is one of my favorite songs, like I said, by the Smiths. And I feel like I started to see this transition from not just hip hop, but I think a lot of mainstream music, like in the last three or four years have started to move towards like, back towards this rock, like loud, positive energy, like party nonstop. And I was seeing not just in the rap industry, but in these other places, what I felt like was not the best contribution to um, rock, like being like somebody that like grew up listening to rock music. And I feel you wanna, like- Do you wanna call anybody out for being phony? I don't wanna call anybody out for being phony because you know what? And I think if I called anybody out, I would call everybody out. But I think the whole idea yeah. of being like a fan is essentially, and it was never cool to be a poser, but you kind of are a poser because you're not the person that you are posing as or that you kind of idolize. Um, but for me, I just felt like I haven't done any um, samples like hip hop wise since 2014. And I yeah, have like a full- That game. album, sampleless album. Sampleless album and all live instrumentation. And that's where we were coming from is like, let's really try to put out some music that's feel good, positive, and like a good representation of not just rock and roll, but hip hop, because it doesn't just have to be like, you know, the market that they say, you know, we are. Um, as and, it's, and it's also helpful not to have to worry about clearing samples. That's, also that's the biggest thing. That's honestly why I, I stopped doing samples in 2014. I put out Broad Shoulders and we didn't sample anything specifically for the reason that we didn't independently want to handle or going through, you know, the sample clearance problems. And it just lasted and became like something that like, I've just always stuck with. Uh, Taylor, as everyone probably knows you, you are the brother of Chance the Rapper. And my first question, of course, is has to be like, were you guys competitive growing up? Or did you guys get along? Did you guys butt heads? What was your relationship like as kids? Yeah, for sure. Um, I have two sons now. So like, <clears throat> I can see clearly that, yes, we used to butt heads. It's funny. Um, when I was younger, I probably didn't think so much. But it's also, I think, um, as kids, less of butting heads and more of competitiveness um towards each other. And I think that for sure when it came to music, um, not so much in the idea of, you know, who has the best raps, but I think that indulging, indulging in hip hop as a culture was a competitive thing for me and my brother. So like I showed my brother um, Diamonds Are Forever, like the remix that um, Jay-Z was on. And it was like always trying to find these new different things that were going on from the internet that was just bubbling up when we were kids and then being able to introduce it in a way that we knew more than the other person about hip hop. Oh. Um, and that was like the competitiveness for sure. So it was like a nerdy competitiveness. Nerdy, it it's still to this day, like I still like go like, you know, when I, you know, go out to the studio yesterday, I'm like, you know, have you seen this new show like Southside? Have you seen, do you know this artist, you know, Lil Russell, like, are you, because, and it's also, it became our business though, as well as like, you know, knowing these different things and also at a young age, seeing so many artists and following their careers so closely, I think gave me and my brother um, a pretty good understanding of the industry as well. Yeah, yeah, you know? absolutely. I was really curious about Throwaways Unmixed. Oh yeah. Um, especially because I feel like, you know, it's always the mix. The mix is always a problem. Like I feel like artists, they yeah. write music all day long, every, you know what I mean? But it's right. really, when it comes down to the mix, it becomes like, it can sometimes be the biggest problem. So why yeah. did you make the decision to put an album um, unmixed and call it throwaways mm -hmm. unmixed? Um, super interesting. Well, you know, what was, I think what was going on in my head at the time, and I think it made sense is like, you know, as an artist, you can create so much music and it can just mm -hmm. sit. Um, so, and for like the smallest reasons, like you just said, where it's like this chorus doesn't stick or the mix isn't right, or I don't have a name for this. Or you're like over it, you know, like you experience it and you almost don't want, you want to like leave it behind. And you want to, and I feel like for me, it's never really so much of me wanting to leave things behind, but what does happen, which is what I was talking about earlier, which is why this project was so much fun for me. Cause it's so, 
many genres that are involved in it is maybe the song didn't fit the project at the time that I was working on. And just for that solo reason, it wasn't introduced. And then I got further along and years later, you know, things weren't created. So with the Unmixed project though, um, my thought was just, I have these songs that are sitting here and they're really good. And I feel like nobody will ever get to hear them. And I would love to put these tracks out. And I feel like as, an independent artist, um, there's a different mindset that kind of comes with me when I'm like, I'm just gonna give this to my fans. Mm. Um, versus I feel like, of course, a lot of other artists that might think, you know, is this, can I? For me, I'm just like, oh my gosh, you know? So um, that was a record I put out. And it's, thank you for asking me about that. Cause a lot of my uh, like really super fans are like, whenever I see them or meet them in person, they're like, yeah, like the throwaway is like the unmixed, like blah, blah, blah. Like, I love that song. I love the song with you and Chance and like, so yeah. Well, you, you're you're a fan of like 80s alternative rock and stuff. Yeah. Think about a lot of those albums were recorded in a weekend or a week yeah. or, you know. Or like, you know, a lot of those, I mean, and that's also like a thing too, is like the the recording process for me is very different. And I think has changed from what it used to be. Whereas I had songs that were great ideas, but I might've been rushing because I didn't have that much money to finish for the studio time. Now I do, but I never went back and I never revisited it. However, on this one project, and I'm so glad that you brought that up, a very interesting thing that happened is we did the whole project, it was totally finished. And there was this last song, um, and um, there was this last song, and it was a really, really, really old song. Um, called Mumble Rap that I had created. Um, and my music director, Vernon, was like, man, this does not fit the project. Like the project is already done. I don't know why we would, you know, throw this on there. And then I sent it to Jeremiah and Jeremiah got on it. Um, Chicago legend, shout out to him. And once he heard it, he was like, oh, I see what we're doing. And we started kind of adding more of those rock elements, guitar and stuff like that. But sometimes I do go back to these tracks that I've made in 2018 and say, oh no, like this needs to come out like right now. We gotta, so yeah. Yeah, um, you have, in addition to all your music, you're, you're, you're into fashion and style and aesthetics yeah. and everything. And you put out this um, capsule collection with, with Champion Athletics. First yeah. of all, Champion is such a classic clean brand. Like- They're like, I like, love Champion. It's like yeah. the standard. It's like the standard and they have like high level stuff. They have affordable stuff. It's like all. And that's brand. like, yeah. And that, um, you know, that's interesting. That probably brings me to, so yeah. So my brand Be Yourself, we did a collaboration with Champion um, and it started off as just being something that was focused around mental health and physical health awareness. So it was kind of like comfortable hoodies. We had uh, sweatshirts, we had like um, mesh shorts, um, t-shirts. And then the conversation just kept going. And I gotta say shout out to Champion because they kind of, I think really understood my initiative and something I look to do with my brand, which is um, when I created the brand Be Yourself in 2018, it was a year after I came out openly bisexual and joined the LGBTQ community openly. Um, but it was also a way that project when I released it of expanding that environment similar to a lot of artists that I grew up listening to where I felt comfortable expressing myself and learning more about myself because there was that environment. Um, but I did realize in 2018 that, you know, that was something that was just digital and it was just in your ears. And that's when we created the brand Be Yourself and it became kind of like this billboard of positivity. Um, and there were so many fans and people that were interested in supporting it, even people that had no idea who I was and, you know, what exactly the music was, but just supported the idea of, you know, being who you are and self-expression. And then when we started talking to, you know, Champion later on, and we were talking about, you know, doing this merchandise capsule, I was explaining the idea of this environment and the fact that I had coming of age, a new project that was about to be released. And I wanted to expand that environment in a way that fans could come to a place for a certain amount of time and feel comfortable again, expressing themselves in this moment that they're coming of age. Um, and they were like, we see what you're talking about. What do you think about doing some kind of tour? And um, it ended up rolling into the Be Yourself, Be a Champion tour with all the merchandise. 
but it was really cool because we went to colleges, all the shows were free. And I met so many different fans, but even more so, I saw my fans meeting each other that didn't know each other that went to the same colleges. And, you know, from time to time, I see them posting on their social media and tagging each other with the brand and stuff like that. So um, just shout out to them because I think they understood the idea that I wanted to expand the environment for people um, and continue to do that, you know, not whether it's hoodies or it's tours or it's music or whatever it is to keep pushing, you know, the Be Yourself brand. So amazing partnership and yeah, like I super love Champion. They're dope. That is so dope. I'm also really curious about your decision to stay independent. Yeah. Because there's always like this, I mean, you hear it in like every, Almost like every rapper that I've ever listened to a tune of theirs, they talk about like, oh, no, I'm independent. Like, fuck that label money and all that shit. <laughs> what is, yeah, why is your decision to, yeah. yeah, to stay independent right now? It's so raw. I'm glad that you said that. Because, yeah, I feel like it's like a, a much higher, um, it's like cool now to say that you're independent. Like, yeah. um, and when my brother and I, I think we're really making the decisions in like 2013, 2016, 2015, like in kind of turning down deals. It was something that a lot of people had speculation about and they didn't really understand. Mm -hmm. um, and I think like the logic that I use, because there's so many stupid, and I, I don't mean to say, well, yeah, it, it, for me, in my opinion on it, is stupid terminology that's kind of used in the industry when we talk about publishing and we talk about mechanicals and we talk about you know uh points or your royalty master um and administration there's all these words and it's like oh my god what does that mean so the way that i like to say it just for like the fans and people that are listening um simplistically is like if you have you ever made a sandwich and not known what you wanted to do with it so have you ever walked into the kitchen and you create a sandwich and you don't know one, if you wanna save it or if you wanna give it to a family member or if you yourself want to eat it. Um, and I feel like usually people say, no, I don't just make sandwiches for no reason. And mm -hmm. the sandwich in this example is the product, right? Mm -hmm. And usually I feel that when someone creates anything, they have a certain understanding or an ideal on how they would like to see that product marketed or where they'd like to see it go. But I feel like in the music industry, in um, the sports industry, um, in the entertainment business with actors and in a lot of other spaces, there's an idea that if you create a sandwich, then you need a manager um, mm -hmm. or that you need somebody that can facilitate and tell you the right ways to divide and split and, um, and it's also really in the same, and you guys might've heard this before, but that you can't do the talent and the business um, is like something that for a long time, for so many different groups um, of people, and like I said, in so many different artistries has been a thing. Um, and for myself, I've always known what I wanted to do with the sandwich, where I wanted to take the sandwich, who I wanted to show the sandwich to. Um, and I think early on, it was less of me feeling the confidence in myself and more of me not feeling the confidence in someone else. Mm -hmm. And I think for a lot of artists, because the music industry and Hollywood and all these places have been here forever and they're not going anywhere, right? Um, and I think a lot of artists look at those, you know, situations, their favorite artists, labels, um, uh, you know, brands or companies, agencies, and they say, well, if they could do that for them, then they could do it for me. And what I do believe is through Chance's independent strides, my independent strides, uh, Russ, La Russell, you know, you kind of name it, different artists, there has been a major push, like you said, from artists to start to question and look and say, hey, can I just use, you know, United Masters or TuneCore or DistroKid or whatever to get this out? Like, can I just, you know, maybe know somebody at Apple? If I am doing, you know, 3 million streams, maybe mm -hmm. they want to talk to me. Um, and we've been seeing that a lot too with the different platforms and, you know, they're putting things to help artists not have to, you know, sign these deals to get their music out. So for me, I think it it's always been kind of the uncertainty and then it began, began to become my confidence as I got, you know, stronger. And then now I feel like, you know, signing a deal usually, and they, you could get a deal in anyway. So you could get, you know, a million dollars and not have to do anything. It's very rare. I don't think it's ever happened before. 
but usually a deal is like a recoupment. So you have to pay it back. Mm -hmm. uh, and the one thing that I've been very fortunate with is I've had the creative control to create Be Yourself, a brand that you know openly supports my sexuality and people's self-expression. But I've also been able to um, write fit, your own narrative. Right, write my own narrative. And mm -hmm. if there's a hiccup in my narrative, there's no one else that gets to predict or decide if it's if I'm done or if I'm finished, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's like a very important thing to have in the industry and be able to keep the relationships. And so that's why I've been independent. I think I'll always stay independent. Um, you know, it's just my feelings on it. Now, there's a lot been said about how little artists make on streaming, you know, the yeah. fifth of a penny or whatever it is. That's, true. that's a real thing. Yeah. And that's what I, how much of that has to do with your decision to stay independent because you're not getting album sales. This isn't the 90s where you were selling right. millions of CDs and stuff. And well, you, how, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, no, you go ahead because you, this is well, a great. Well, I was just curious if from your side, have you kind of, as, as, as someone who produces, manages, and also makes music and stuff. Have you kind of accepted that that's the fate of artists that they're going to have to indefinitely accept mm. of a third of a penny per stream? Yeah. I mean, I think, the um, well, you know, the thing is this, so I don't care. I'm not that famous yet. Yeah, maybe one day they'll pull it up and say, Hey, don't give that guy that deal. He said this. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. Don't um, assume that yourself. Yeah, of course. But I mean, yeah, of course not. But I mean, this is public information. So like, you know, yeah. when you distribute, say, a song through Apple, you know, they take 30 percent. Right. Because they're the store. Like, imagine if there's a Walmart. Right. And you're selling your product in Walmart. Walmart has to pay the security. And they have to pay the lights. They have to keep the, the uh, store clean and make sure it's working. So there's those fees that, you know, are subtracted from that. And then again, there's a lot of artists that are in deals. They might not even most artists have a percentage or receive a percentage of their royalty. They just have an advance. So they've been paid, you know, prior to a lot of the streaming. I honestly think that the streaming conversation and the issue lied less between the artist and more between the labels and the publishers. Um, for myself, I feel like, you know, I do receive 70% of like most of the tracks that I make, or at least that's the gross before it's split amongst producers and collaborators, because I don't have a distri distribution deal or a publishing deal or a label deal. But at the same time, um, there are so many different ways. I mean, you know, then this is why I love history, like Prince invented ticket bundling. So he used to sell albums with his tickets. He was the first person to do it. Then everybody started doing it. And then the RIAA came in and shut it down. Like, hey, you can't just sell albums for your hoodies. You know, um, now there's up sales and there's different. So there's so many different ways. No one manip he manipulates it more than DJ Khaled. I feel like DJ Khaled is <laughs> the bundling master. The well, you want to know something? Um, and DJ Khaled, I've, I haven't looked too much into exactly the bundles that he does, but I will say that he is, I believe, with Rock Nation Management. And if you look back, you know, who doesn't remember, you know, Jay-Z doing the huge deal with Blueprint and Samsung? Or who really doesn't remember getting an iPhone with U2 on it? Like if you don't remember still, that album, it still oh, plays. Yeah. It's if still you don't plays. remember that album, right? Yeah. And that was a bundling. That was like one of the first biggest like bundling deals. So everybody got that U2 album. They sold these units. So basically, to say that there's always a way, you know, to to significantly make money. I think what a lot of artists might have an issue with, and I understand, is if they're in a 360 deal. And that means that everything they do, merchandise, touring, music, all of that, they get, you know, a large percentage taken away. They might be looking at the music and saying the most, you know, revenue that I'm making is from these top singles and I'm getting paid, you know, fractions mm -hmm. of it. Um, and I could I could understand that. But I think honestly, I think streaming is a temporary thing. Like, I don't think it's something really I think yeah, it's I think. Streaming is a temporary thing. Um, you guys know that before streaming was even invented, physical distribution was practically dead. Like the only thing that people were buying were vinyls and it was like fine sound. I don't know if you guys have heard of that, but like before there was, you know, 
So it's like almost a thing to say, you guys remember LimeWire and like mm -hmm. there and all that stuff. And then came SoundCloud and then came, you know, Spotify and Pandora and such is the evolution. Um, I think that people will still want their music and such to be on demand, but I think just the idea of continuously having to either search for a group or you kind of, I guess, aggregate yourself to a certain room of influence, I think that'll kind of die out. Um, and I think it really got strong. I, I mean, I think that COVID helped streaming out a lot too, you know, with all the different shows. Because streaming isn't just music, you know, streaming is, is TV. It's like a lot of different stuff. And here's something that can happen too, is you can have a song with hundreds of millions of streams, but no one really is familiar with the artist. The artist hasn't branded themselves. So you can have a song exactly. with so many streams because it's been playlisted on a million playlists mm -hmm. and all this stuff, but like no one really knows who the artist is. Yeah, I mean, I think the last thing that I would say like on this topic that I love is like, um, you know, like the idea of shifting from album sales and, and streaming to trying to be in this world of TikTok timestamps and um, the whole thing is that there's music, you have the music, and then you have the music industry. And the music industry is technology and music meeting. So that's anytime Steve Jobs, you know, is like, yo, I've got a great way or anybody that said for music to be re redistributed to the people. It's still a narrative, it's still a story. And then you have the music business and the music business are the people that facilitate this information and then it's their job to hold it from the masses until they figure out a way to monetize you know from it so it's like a lot of different information technology that's out there and i know you guys know this that we might not be privy to yet because there might not be an absolute control or a way for people to profit exponentially from it um and that goes to the blockchain conversation and so many other things that are out yeah, there. Yeah, the, the 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 metaverse aspect of, of the music industry is a whole different. That's a whole different podcast. A whole different podcast. We won't go down that route. You do so we'll much other than the music. Um, you're you're very much involved. You're an artist that's very much involved in the process of making your own music as well. Um, and I really I think what your fans might really be interested in too is what is the daily life like for you? So you wake up. Mm. And tell us from the moment you wake up to the moment you get back into bed, like on average, what your day looks like. So like three days out of the week, I wake up, um, I wake up probably at like 6.30 earliest, latest 7.30. Because wow. I have to get my son, my oldest son, Charlie, together for school. Um, and that's three days out the week because he only goes on three days and then the other two yeah. stays home. A dad's schedule is different than a, a non-dad schedule. Right. It's super different. But, you know, my dad taught me this schedule. He, my brother gets up at the same time. He's also a dad. But since we were younger, six o'clock is like when he used to have us wake up. Yeah. Um, but basically get Charlie together, um, of course, with my partner um, and my wife. And basically from there, take him to school, drop him off. Um, usually because of like, you know, we have a Google calendar that just stays filled with whether it's like my, my interviews, my business, or it's especially chances business. And usually throughout the week, we have like these different calls that are set up right there. They're the production calls or the management calls or UTA, our agency's calls or Surefire, the best PR in the world, <laughs> phone calls. <laughs> Shout out Corey. Mm -hmm. Um, but just like, um, no matter what it is, there's every day, there's something that's on my schedule. And then of course, all the new opportunities are like implemented into that. So like probably right after I drop Charlie off, I get into hopping on the phone, seeing the calls, seeing what's going on. Usually I'll come home. Um, once I get to the house, um, usually fitness, um, because I usually eat breakfast, um, Starbucks with me and Charlie. That's one thing I kind of skipped out. Um, Starbucks. He loves Starbucks, Starbucks over Dunkin' Starbucks. Donuts. Uh, he loves. Oh my God, he loves Dunkin' Donuts because they have donuts all this morning. <laughs> when he wakes up, I was supposed to take him to Dunkin' Donuts. He has speech therapy this morning, and I took him home and told him I would order, and I never did. So I'm oh, sure no. you know, after this interview, he's gonna be like, "Where's my donut with sprinkles?" He wants a pink. <laughs> oh man, strawberry with uh, rainbow sprinkles. But yeah, so then basically coming home. Um, 
once I get to the house, usually fitness. So I go upstairs to my roof. If it's nice, it's been, but it's getting cold because I'm in Chicago. And um, it's either chest and back or arms and legs. Um, mm. And it's like um, core and shoulders circuit every day, um, except for Sundays, most Sundays. Um, and then I guess from there, it depends. I'll either, because it can be, it can be a day of mine where I'm going to the recording studio to meet up with my music director, Dwayne Verner, um, DJ Verner, the executive producer of Coming of Age, um, or it could be us gearing up for a show. So I'm going to practice, still going to meet up with Verner, or it could be me actually going to meet up with my brother and headed out to the suburbs or to his house in the city to talk either business or figuring, you know, kind of the timeline, which is like one of the most privy things that I kind of do for my brother. Um, and then usually mid afternoon, like one, two, which is what I was doing before this is why I was late, is I'm getting lunch or going to get lunch or getting lunch for my wife. So- uh, That's what I was gonna ask. I was like, when when does the wife come into play? When does That's what, so yeah. And then we usually have lunch. This is when she comes into play right now. Hey, um, yeah. oh, um, yeah. She's been calling me. She's like, she has no idea this interview is going on. So oh, we, like, we need to wrap this yes. up so you can get back to wifey, you know? Definitely. Uh, but yeah, that's really like my day. And then I go back, pick up um, Charlie from school. And then we all come home. We usually watch. They usually actually watch TV and play in their room. And then probably, I know this is getting really descriptive. Probably mm -hmm. around eight, we have dinner. And then we watch movies almost latest 930, but most of the time it's like nine o'clock. Oh, so, so the kids get stay up a little bit later than, than a lot of kids do. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like they get to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, nice. Yeah. Majority of times. Yeah. That sounds very mm -hmm. balanced. Yeah. You're like, yeah. I feel like the that's boss, the key. CEO, all of it. You have family life. That sounds like a perfect balance. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, we got to let you go, Taylor. So much. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. And congratulations on, on the new project. And we look forward to whatever you come up with next in terms of your music, your branding, Thank you. everything. Awesome, man. I appreciate it. Pop Dust, legendary. Um, Hashtag be yourself. Soon. Let's go. I got to yeah. get you some of these. Yeah, yeah. Taylor, where, where can people pick up uh, any of your gear? Make sure to go to shop.taylorbennett.co and then make sure to check out the new project, Coming of Age, available everywhere now. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Taylor. We'll talk to you later. Thank you, man. Appreciate it, bro. All right. All right. Bye-bye. Peace. That was wow. Taylor Bennett. I feel like this is one of the first episodes that Jordan and I literally learned so much about. I, I definitely, that people, people, uh, a lot of people um, that follow the show know that Demi is a musician and she's in a band and she's, you know, releasing music, but I'm not, I'm sort of, I, I tell people like on my dating profiles on, on like on, on hinge and <laughs> stuff, I put that I'm sort of music industry or music industry adjacent. So, um, I sort of absorb all this things just by listening to Demi and listening to our guests and stuff. So I, I find it really interesting. Yeah. That, that episode definitely dove deep into kind of like what it's like to be an artist and kind of like even the business side too. He's such a business person outside of the artist. And I think that's so cool. Yeah. 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 And it's wild to think that he's still in his, he's like your age. He's like I know. I was like, I feels, like, go he feels like a 50 year old research. CEO or something. I know. Yeah, well, yeah. that's definitely where he's headed. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. All right, guys, that'll do it for us. We are here together and I think we'll be here together for at least one more show um, in LA. Uh, Demi, do you have anything coming out you want to shout out? Or just, Oh, me and Jordan might have something coming out soon. So yes, yeah. yes, we, we have but a, don't tell them. yes, we have <laughs> multiple projects of, um, those of you who follow pop dust know that Demi has another show called Demi Ramo show mm -hmm. where she interviews people. We actually go out on location and stuff. So we have, uh, some, some content coming, uh, in that direction soon. So anyway, <laughs> Uh, as always, check us out on Instagram at Jordan Edwards Studio, at Demi underscore Ramos, and listen to past episodes on Spotify, iHeartRadio, wherever you listen to your podcasts, and go to popdust.com for all the latest in pop culture and music news. Until next time, we'll see you later. Mm -hmm.